Ramjack, the foundation repair experts. Congratulations, Westside Patriots, on your three-peat state championship win. Live from Augusta, you're watching News 12 at 6 o'clock. We are live inside day five of the public master plan meetings for Richmond County Schools. Time is running out to hear the plan and to speak out about it. We're going to get to that in just a moment. But first, the family of an Aiken County teacher killed after a utility pole fell on her is filing a lawsuit. Her family says they want one thing. Responsibility. I don't you know how to say it other than that. Last August, Janelle Robinson died after a power pole fell on her on Main Street in Wagner. And today, her family filed that lawsuit against Dominion Energy and broadband provider Comporium. Taylor Martin breaks down what the lawsuit is claiming. It's no longer fair to allow a family and a community to be victimized, and we have decided to fight back. Fighting back with a 113-page lawsuit alleging the condition of the poles and power lines in Wagner played a large part in Janelle's death, calling it preventable as the poles were more than 70 years old. Now they're asking Dominion and Comporium to take accountability. Comporium says not our poles, not our responsibility. We don't buy that. Not for one second. And according to this email from the town clerk to Dominion, the suit says Dominion told the town it was, quote, not Dominion's problem to fix. Documents in the suit say this all happened just weeks before Janelle's death. Five weeks before Ms. Robinson was stolen from a family and entire community who loved her. When it first happened, they asked for a little more than $100 million in compensation. Now they say it's the minimum they'll accept for the loss of Janelle. We are pushing for the sky. And they say the next steps are to serve those defendants with the lawsuit and then start preparing for the trial. But just an unusual freak accident, a real tragedy for the town. And you would think it's a freak accident, except that the polls have been there 70 years. And they have that documented. 70 that they years. They said something about it. Yeah. All right. So sending things now over to Chief Alert Chief Meteorologist Riley Hale. And Riley, we're expecting weather. We are expecting weather. It was a little bit chilly. Start Thank you, Riley. After tonight, Richmond County parents will only have one more session to give their opinion about the school system's five-year master plan. Right now, school leaders are meeting at Bel Air K-8. through And this impacts students at Bel Air K-8, through Copeland Elementary, Reynolds Elementary, Langford Middle, and Bel Air Middle, so several schools. The plan recommends splitting Bel Air K-8 through and making a new elementary and middle school. Sydney Hood joins us live from the school. So, Sydney, we know parents have a lot to say as they have about all of these school changes so far. Exactly. All these meetings have been going well into the night and all these conversations are centered around this proposed plan that could determine their child's future and whether or not your child's school is listed in this plan, you could be impacted as well. By now, you've probably heard about this five-year master plan for Richmond County Schools. Each page lays out some type of change for children around the district. The board says it has a lot to do with funding and enrollment. 16 elementary, 6 middle, and 4 high schools don't meet the minimum enrollment number for state funding, which brings us to the decision to either close or combine some schools. The school system's plan lays out three options, more program offerings, low cost, and small school sizes, but only two can work. So say you prefer low cost and small schools, the odds of robust programs are slim. This PIC2 public survey from December shows 91% voted for robust programs, 56% for small schools, and 53% for low cost. The same survey also tells us what many of your thoughts are. One says tradition is important, but so is maximizing our work. Another says we can barely control buildings with students that are not at capacity. Putting 1,200 students in one school with rival gangs and neighborhoods is a recipe for disaster. And as this 
meeting behind me gets started, I've heard a lot of parents go in saying that they want to hear where the state funding is going. What programs is this money going to pour into? A lot of these parents are telling me they'd like to see more poured into the arts programs. So there's a lot to talk about tonight, and the last meeting for these public meetings is tomorrow. So parents, if you can't make it out here, that meeting tomorrow is at 3 o'clock at the Board of Education office. And we will have a wrap of tonight's meeting if you miss it at on News 12 at 11. And as City mentioned, tomorrow is that final meeting. And this time, instead of starting at 6, it will start at 3 p.m. at the Richmond County Board of Education Auditorium. And if you miss your students' meeting for their assigned school, they'll be doing an overview of the five-year master plan for all of the schools. You can scan that flow code on your screen to catch up on those previous meetings. A 21-year-old club car contractor is dead after an accident at the facility in Evans. The Columbia County Coroner's Office says it was an industrial accident. 21-year-old Alyssa Drinker passed away at the hospital Friday night. A spokesperson with Club Car says they're working with authorities as they investigate what happened. Washington County High School in Sandersville mourning the loss of one of their students. In a letter sent home to parents today, school leaders say Tyson Tillman passed away. They go on to say, quote, the Washington County School District would like to express our sincere condolences to his family and friends. This news has brought a deep sadness to our school family. There is no word on when it happened or the cause, but our thoughts are also with the Washington County School District right now. And they do have a crisis intervention team on hand to help anyone who wants to talk this out. While there's a lot of focus on Georgia's presidential primary tomorrow, we also now know who's going to be on the ballot in the May election. One of the big races here in Richmond County, the race for sheriff. And there are three people running in May for that Democratic spot. Every Monday here, we will profile a different candidate for Richmond County Sheriff. News 12's Craig Allison sat down with candidate Gino Brantley today. Eugene Gino Brantley is no stranger to serving Richmond County. He started working for the sheriff's office in 2000 and went to work for the marshal's office in 2016. He's now a sergeant who oversees evictions. From his point of view, he says the standard has dropped. The state of the sheriff's office is in a bit of disarray, and the citizens of the county deserve better service from the sheriff's office. He cites poor response times to emergencies, a lack of morale, and a need for more deputies to be active in the community as reasons to run for office. He also wants to take on a unique approach to solve overcrowding at the Charles B. Webster Detention Center. And how many of the inmates in the, in the jail are in there that have mental health problems and probably should be you know, in a hospital or in some other institution and not the jail. And we probably have 20 to 25 percent, I would think. At the end of the day, he says the route to solving these issues is retaining more officers. Brantley says fewer officers leaving for nearby counties would lead to more interest in joining the Richmond County cause. I want to improve the morale of the uh, sheriff's office. Right now, the deputies don't feel as if they're valued and they're underappreciated. And if you could fix that, you would in encourage more people to join the sheriff's office. In Augusta, Craig Allison, on your side. And he says if elected, he'll focus his first six months in office getting first-hand perspectives to understand which issues need his attention the most. We're going to have that full interview posted on the website, wrdw.com. By the way, there are no Republican candidates and just one independent who qualified as a candidate but is still working to get those 6,700 signatures needed by July the 1st to run in November. We're reaching out to all the sheriff's candidates to profile each one. While well, the national spotlight is, of course, on the presidential race, there are a lot of important local races to be decided, like the sheriff's race in the coming months. These local races can often be overlooked but have major implications on things you do every day. And as Alyssa Lyons reports, election season is just cranking up. That it is. The Board of Elections says they see it every election cycle. Voters get to the polls. You pick your House, your Senate, the President. That's page one. That's also where voters can lose interest, leaving the votes that impact you daily unchecked. And a lot of people like to come out and vote for president, but really, when was the last time the president fixed the pothole in front of your house? Probably not. Their schedule may be a little booked. Local's different. These people make decisions on how our lives are impacted on a daily basis from education, public transit, from even the clean water that we drink. In May, in Richmond County, commission, sheriff, and district attorney races are a hot commodity. 
in Columbia County. It's the Georgia House District 131 Coroner, Commission District 2 and 3, and School Board District 4. People don't realize just how important it is. They're hoping traction only continues to grow. We're basically seeing a replay of 2020. But the Board of Elections say it's up to the local parties to bring the party to the polls. Personally, I think that's up to the candidate and the parties. I think they should be the ones who have to generate that the excitement and the energy in an election. So that it carries over to the ballot box. In order to make an impact, we've got to get out the vote. We've got them registered, but one in five people vote in local elections. One in five. For the May primary starts at the end of April. We're also working to get a list together of all the qualified candidates for May. As we get those, we'll post them to WRDW.com. Okay, thanks, Alyssa. Some very important races yeah. ahead of us. South Carolina had a huge turnout for the primary. We'll see what Georgia does. Yeah, I uh, imagine there's going to be a, a lot of buzz. Mm -hmm. A conceivable chase just around the corner, but will you be able to place a bet? We break down where sports betting stands in the two state next on News 12 at 6 o'clock. And beautiful weather heading our way over the next several days. No rain till we close out the week. We'll have that full forecast next. Time and be plenty of dry weather mixed in. So once again, don't cancel anything just yet, but keep an eye on the forecast the next few days. Will do, Riley. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> Excuse me. It is that time of year. The countdown begins for the Triple Crown in Aiken. This weekend, the equestrian world turns its attention to the 81st running of the Aiken Trials. This year, the focus is taking a shift. Lawmakers have not locked in a sports betting bill in Georgia or South Carolina, but they just approved one in North Carolina. But as our Hallie Turner explains, it could mean big bucks if it comes to the two-state. When it comes down to sports betting, there are many conversations on both sides of the topic. But here in South Carolina, some say if passed, money generated from the bet itself could go beyond this track and the fun. Everything is fine, but fine is just the problem. We're managing to do okay. We're not losing money now, but we're really not making money. Bill Gutfar believes one way to fix this is sports betting. Like a good bet, he's hoping it pays. Our business model is about half our revenue comes from track use and stall use, and the other half comes from the trials, which are coming up in, in another week or so. If we could have sponsorship from these um, teams, that would certainly help our bottom line. But He's hoping to cash out. South Carolina right now is leaving a lot of money on the table or letting it go elsewhere, where we could have it here, and then it would generate money, which could go back into the state into the horse industry. He says racehorse owners continue to burn a hole in their pocket to keep their horses in shape, healthy, and on the track. There's a woman here, she was just in the office a few minutes ago. She owns several horses that run in New York. And her horse ran one day and won. And I said, Susie, did you, did you make some money today? She said, I can't. You guys gotta get that bill passed. I can't bet here. In Aiken, Hallie Turner, on your side. On the Georgia side, obviously the Masters Tournament would be a huge moneymaker. No doubt about that. And the bill sponsored by State Senator Lee Anderson. It passed the Senate, but is currently sitting in the House. We will keep our eye on it all the way through. NFL free agency underway, and the Atlanta Falcons have agreed to terms with their new quarterback. Dan has the latest on the Falcons' big move next in sports. All right, what do we got? Looks like 64 yards in the pen. About 64 mile per hour winds? Dude, there's no wind. Hang my 64 degree wedge. What's it with you and 64? Are you 64? Dot com! You can mark. Coming up tonight on the CBS Evening News, a technical issue on a Boeing flight out of Australia leaves 50 passengers injured, plus new details about the Justice Department investigation into the aerospace company. That and more headlines tonight on the CBS Evening News. Here's a live look from our SRP park. At the CBS Evening News, we focus on solutions, finding solutions to help people understand what are the right choices to make for you and your family. 